All right, so folks, uh, welcome to the members meeting for uh, Miami Blue Chapter. Uh, first of all, let me thank Anna Rojas for making the venue available. Very nice. Uh, it's one of our better uh, places, and so thanks, Anna. Uh, we've got an action-packed agenda. Uh, Jason has got a, a Q and a, a, a series of questions for you, and then I'm going to recognize Adam to introduce our guest speaker. All right, uh, let it's not moving to the next thing. Uh, Q and A. All right, greetings. Uh, my name is Jason Claiborne. I guess we'll start to see test your butterfly knowledge. Uh, name two imperiled butterflies that potentially could live in Darien Estate. That would be really exciting if we found their caterpillars or chrysalises. What do you think? So two, th these two butterflies are listed as federally endangered. Do y'all remember? What, what is it? It is a scrub hair streak, but what's the first part of the name? So the Bartram scrub hair streak uh, potentially can live out here. Uh, Anna, have you ever seen any around here? No. All right. Um, and then what is the other one? What's like the big one that's extremely rare? But we'll, we'll bring every new organization here on here. I wasn't even thinking of that one, but what is it? So the shout swallowtail, if it flies over from Elliott Key. Um, and then what's the other one that is in Everglades National Park? The Florida leaf wing. So it, we have pineland croton here. So if you get the barch from scrub, there's always the potential for the Florida leaf wing. So those are butterflies of interest that may or may not um, exist here, but that would be a really great find. All right. Um, let me click on this. Um, so if you're not a member, consider becoming a member. If you go to the website, um, here are the pages that you can check out to uh, figure out how to become a member. But there's a lot of uh, benefits to becoming a member. You get to go on butterfly walks, um, learn about butterflies and butterfly gardening. Um, right now, uh, the president, Dennis, is going to talk about some of the projects that they're involved in in habitat restoration and acquisition to promote butterflies. Um, and you have a community of people who are interested in butterfly education, conservation, and camaraderie. So here is the information which is available on the website, miamiblue.org. Just type in miamiblue.org and that'll access like everything. All right. So next up we have uh, Adam and he is gonna introduce our guest speaker. Um, the microphone, the microphone is right if you wanna use this one. Good afternoon, everyone. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Andy Davis. Andy is an assistant research scientist in the Odom School of Ecology that's at the University of Georgia. He is an animal ecologist with interest in migrations, echophysiology, and functional morphology. And for the last 25 years, he has studied the famous monarch butterflies of North America. In particular, Andy's research on monarchs has focused on how their wing color helps them fly, how parasites affect their development, and how their migration affects their population. He has also been heavily involved in research tracking the long-term changes in the North American population. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Andy Davis. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you. All right. Should I, I'm going to share my screen if that's all right? Yes. All right. Let me know if you see it. We see it. Awesome. So I can't see anybody in the room. Um, so who am I speaking to? Um, so right now it's Jason Claiborne. But you have about roughly maybe 20 to 25 people in the audience um, in person right now. Oh, so wow. we're all NABA uh, Miami Blue members. Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm very familiar with with the, the, the main organization, NABA, and I'm going to be talking about that today. So I want to thank you, you, you all for having me here. 
and thanks for for returning out to listening to me in person. And I also understand that this is going to be recorded and placed online. So to everybody watching at home, you know, welcome as well. So I don't know if you've if you've heard of me. I, I kind of have a reputation as a scientist who you know makes no uh, who, who doesn't really mess mess around. Um, I've kind of got a reputation as somebody who just tells the truth uh, about what what the data shows, and that's kind of what I'm going to do today. So um, you need to also tell me before I get too rolling. How long would you like me to go? Because I can go forever. When do you want me to stop? Um, so we typically do anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes. Okay, I got you. So We're I'll... probably going to have a lot of um, questions. Right. So the Q&A might be um, longer. So awesome. we want to take time for that. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure we have lots of room for time for that. So before I get going, first, let me reiterate where I'm coming from. Just to make sure everybody is aware that our football team is better than yours better than everybody's actually, twice in a row, just to make sure you're all aware that we have a really good football team and you don't. Okay, now that that's done, let me, uh, let me just breeze through this. So thank you for the introduction. This is me. Um, I kind of had this slide in front of most of my talks just to tell everybody where I'm coming from. I've been doing this for a long time, especially with Monarchs. I study a lot of these other critters that you see down here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, beetles, frogs, and also this, this new spider that's that you might have heard some news about last year. So I study a variety of critters, but especially the monarch butterfly. And I also want to point out that I am just a scientist who sits in his office all day looking at data. I'm not part of any conservation group, and I don't sell anything. I'm not going to sell you anything. And I think that's really important for you to realize, to, to see where I'm coming from, because I think that makes me completely objective. I just look at the data, and I'm going to show you what the data shows today. So today, I'm going to sort of go over some recent happenings with monarchs. I'm going to talk about um, some news, obviously, because you've all seen the news. Um, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you what I think the news or the data shows especially regarding monarchs in Florida. Florida monarchs are a very, very special, uh, they have, a, they have a, a, there's a variety of, of issues around Florida monarchs. Some of it good, some of it bad. So today I'm gonna to tell you about the good stuff first and then get to some of the bad and then the really, really bad. And I'm gonna to try to, I'm gonna to try to get through the bad stuff before you guys all kick me out uh, because you're not gonna to like to hear what I'm gonna say. And, and to a lot of people, you know, you know, they don't want me to come back to talk to them after, after I told them this. So I'm going to try to get through that as, as fast as I can. So here's what we've all seen in the news about monarchs. Monarchs are the most beloved insect in the world. And they, according to the news, they've been in trouble for a long time. Um, if I sound a little jaded about that, it's because I am. Um, it seems like any given new cycle, there's always a story about monarchs and how they're they are going to be extinct if we don't take, take these three steps, as it says here. Um, you've all seen the news about monarchs, and I'm sure everybody in the room is doing their part to help with the monarchs. I'm sure of that. You've probably all got like two or three varieties of milkweed, and you've got patches in, in your backyard, and you're all helping. So let me get back to that. So we all know about the monarchs in the news, and you, you, if you're savvy, you probably also know about the, the latest uh, sort of government and non-governmental sort of assessments of the population. In 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service assessed the population, and they, de they determined that the population was in trouble and is deserving of federal protection, although it wasn't warranted at the time. Where it was, it was warranted, but it was precluded because of there were other species high of higher priority. You also probably saw this last year: the IUCN, a conservation organization based in Switzerland, um, 
they have this thing called their red list. And if a species is listed on the red list, that's a big sign, that's a big warning that the species is, is in trouble. And so last, so in 2022, there was an assessment of the monarch population, which determined that they qualify as endangered. Um, all of these assessments, and, and, and also the Canadians, the Canadian government is also on the verge of listing the monarchs in their country as, as endangered as well. So I've been in contact with all of these different organizations about this. All of these, these assessments are based on this graph. And you've probably all seen this. Um, this is the, the size of the overwintering population of monarchs in Mexico. Um, this is by, so there's, you probably also are, are aware that there's a there's an eastern sort of subset of the monarchs east of the Rockies. There's a western subset that we, that winters in California, but the western subset is a teeny teeny tiny little fraction of the entire North American population. They represent like numerically less than one percent of the entire population come, is in California. So the major, vast majority of monarchs. In North America are this main eastern population which travels to Mexico. Now you in, in, in southern Florida, your monarchs likely don't go here. But this is where this graph here is where everybody sort of gets their news about monarchs. You've probably seen this graph ad nauseum. If I sound jaded about this, it's because I am. Because the entire assessment, the entire narrative about monarchs is that they're in trouble because there's fewer of them arriving at Mex in Mexico every year, as you can see from this graph. This much is, is clear. The, the, the winter colonies are getting smaller. Now, I'm going to tell you some good news. And this good news comes from many different sources. Um, and I've participated in a lot of different projects over the years where myself and or people I work with have been trying to understand how the monarch population is doing elsewhere, outside of the wintering colonies. And just to give you a, a sense of, of how much data, how much information there is, um, if you look to the right here, this is a table showing you all of the different data sets that there are, that where, that where there are people and organizations like yours that have been tracking the numbers of monarchs over the years. Some of these go back 20 years, some more, but just know that there's a lot of data out there besides the winter colony data. And myself and others have looked at these numbers from the right-hand side here. And we've, and if you look at, at, at publications that have been written on these numbers, you can see that there's a lot of different data sets out there that, that look, that show the, tr the, the trends in the monarch numbers elsewhere kind of look like this. This is the number of monarchs seen at a migration census place in Cape May, New Jersey in the fall. So ups and downs, as you might expect for an insect, but no real long-term trend, no real long-term decline. Similarly, if you look at the size of the Canadian breeding range, this is from another publication, also no real long-term decline. Um, this is the number of monarchs, monarchs counted at a roost site in Ontario every fall. Lots of ups and downs, but no long-term decline. Basically, a lot of different data sets, not all of them, but like 90% of them show the same kind of pattern. Ups and downs, ups and downs, but no real long-term decline, right? It doesn't look like there's much room, much cause for concern here. But everybody always sees the winter colony numbers, right? That's I bet you everybody in this room has never seen this graph, right? So there's a lot of different data sets like this. Knowing this, myself and a few other folks from UGA last year, these are two of the two of the gentlemen I work with, um, published this one very seminal paper um, it, that came out in a very you know high high profile journal. Global change biology. Myself and these two gentlemen here um, wanted to know what the long-term trends were of monarchs using your own your data, the North American Butterfly Association data. And if you look, we we even have Jess, Jeff Glassberg as a 
co-author in the paper because of the importance of these data. So the guy in the middle there, that's Mike Crosley, he had been working uh, for a number of years with Jeff Glassberg using these data to understand um, the, lo the long-term patterns of a variety of different butterfly species. And so for this one paper here, we all got together and decided to do a, a very big meaty paper looking at long-term trends in monarch abundance. Um, we used data from people just like you. This is a, a snapshot of some people doing a NABA survey in Virginia. And I'm sure everybody in the, in the room today looks just like this. The I don't really need to tell the people in this room what a NABA survey looks like, but just if in case you're not aware for some reason, you all know that you, you get like a circle that you have to sort of assess uh, during, during one or two days in the summer. Um, it's a really big circle. This is a circle from the Midwest and you can have an, as many people as you want, uh, but you'd have to sort of keep track of how many people are watching. You record all the butterflies you see. And for our particular study, we just looked at all of the data from monarch butterflies from going back to the 1990s, 1993. And there were all told 135,000 records of monarchs that we scoured through. Not me, Mike, poor Mike had to do this, but uh, just know that it was a, it was a phenomenal, massive data set where, and it, and it spanned the entire country really, and including some of Canada. These are all NABA, NABA count circles. This is taken directly from the NABA um, website. And in each one of these circles, there are people watching for butterflies, just like yourselves. And so just know that this is probably the biggest assessment of monarch butterfly populations, of the breeding population to date. Um, and so our goal here was to just simply look at the data and see, it, are the numbers going up or down? Because we all know that they're going down in Mexico. Here's my cursor down here. We know that they're going down here. But as I pointed out before, there's also these places around the country where long-term surveys haven't really shown declines. And so our goal here was to put it all together in one gigantic, gigantic data set and see, okay, what's the really happening? So I'm going to cut right to the chase and show you the results. And I'm going to skip over all the analyses, all the, the, the stats. It was it was crazy amount of work. And in, in reality, this project was in the works for a couple of years, actually. It just was published last year. I'm going to show you a map of all of the different monitoring sites. Each of these squares is a monitoring site. And it's color-coded based on the trend in the monarch numbers. Blue means the trend is positive. Yellow and orange means it's negative. A highlighted blue means the trend was significantly positive, like really positive. And if you're looking close, you can see that the one place in the country where the trends were really, really positive was right, right where you are in Florida. And I've put over here on the left some other highlights from the paper. We were also looking at the effects of temperature. We were looking at the effects of, of Roundup crops, glyphosate use. Uh, we showed, and in the, in the end, you know, our, our paper showed that there were declines somewhere, some places. There were increases in other places. But overall, if you put it all together in one giant pile of ball of wax, there was a no real long-term decline. In fact, there was a slight positive increase over the entire period, the, the 25 plus years we had data for, 1.36% per year over the entire, we, like we, we included everything, the West, the East, everything, because it, it really is one giant population. And there were significant increases in Florida. So our paper basically showed that the breeding population of monarchs really isn't in trouble. The, and this is despite the declines that we see in Mexico. So our paper doesn't really show the declines in that the declines in Mexico are wrong, it sh but it shows that numerically speaking, we seem to have lots of monarchs in the summer. I mean, there's no shortage, I guess is, is, the, is the other way to put it. 
Um, there hasn't been a decline. There's been declines in some places, but increases in others. And I think to a lot of people, this was kind of a, a shocker because a lot of people see that graph in Mexico and they go, oh my God, the entire population is, is near collapse. But that's, that's not what our paper showed at all. So think about that. So the other thing I, I wanna point out here, just that there's some other evidence that we have that sort of backs up what I'm showing you, what I'm telling you here. If you actually look at the size of the breeding range of monarchs in the entire country, and I did this once for a blog, this is a, a map with, where showing all of the sightings of monarch butterflies in, in, in the United States on the iNaturalist platform. You're probably all familiar with this platform. But for one exercise uh, last year, I, I made a map showing you where all the monarchs had been seen in the, in the United States in the last 10 years. And this gives you a good idea of what the breeding range of this species is. It's, it's really, you know, every state has monarchs in it. To give you a sense for how this compares to other species, other butterfly species, I, I did the same thing where I also made a map of the breeding range of the 60 most common butterflies in North America. And I graphed the size of the breeding range. I, like I estimated the size of the breeding range from these maps and I graphed where how the monarch compares to everybody to everybody else. And if you look close, the red bar here shows you where the size of the monarch's breeding range compared to everybody else. I mean, it's it's heads and tails bigger. These are the 60 most common butterfly species in North America right here. So the size of the breeding range. So the, the thing I want you to take home from this is that the size of the monarch breeding range is huge, absolutely huge. And this isn't historical data, this is data from the last 10 years. So right now we can say with certainty, monarchs have a bigger breeding range than everybody else. And remember what I said about the paper that, did, that just came out last year, the number, numerically speaking, their numbers in the breeding season have not declined. So this is why I, I think I'm jaded to all of these bad news stories, because numerically speaking, monarchs seem to be doing really, really well, especially in Florida. So um, yeah, so that's the good, the good news I want to tell you guys, right? And that seems like a great thing, right? It, you know, it's, hey, it, it, they're not as in as much trouble as we all thought. Um, I can tell you from, from experience, a lot of people think that this must be wrong, that something must be, because you've all heard over and over and over again how monarchs are in trouble. And I get this a lot that, and in fact, some people get mad at me for telling them that monarchs are doing great. People are like mad that, that I tell them that, that cause they, people have been saving monarchs for a long time and I think that I, when I tell them this, that kind of bursts their bubble. But th this is really good news for monarchs. Okay, so that's the good. Now let's get to the bad. So I was also a, a party to a, another project that, that was just published last year as well. And this is something that you folks in Florida really, really, really need to know about. You may have heard of it of a parasite that gets on monarchs. And this is a picture here of that parasite. That's somebody from my lab or maybe my wife's lab um, showing, holding a butterfly, a monarch, and the, the blow up picture shows this parasite. It's called Ophriocystis electroscara, or just OE for short. It's a protozoan, which means a single celled organism, and it infects monarchs. It's a naturally occurring parasite. It's probably been inf infecting them for eons, hundreds of years, maybe thousands. It's, um, it's a parasite that has evolved with monarchs, basically. Everywhere in the, in, the, in the world where you see monarchs, you also find this parasite to varying levels. Um, so I want you to really pay attention now because you folks in Florida, this 
should be the only thing on your mind right now. There is nothing else that matters as much as this parasite in Florida. So just to give you a brief overview of how this thing works, those spores hang out on the, the abdomen of the monarch. Here's the monarch, here's a monarch female laying eggs. And as the females are laying eggs on the milkweeds, the spores kind of rain down, kind of like confetti or, or glitter, and they sort of land on, on the plant, or sometimes they, they'll, they'll land directly on the eggs. And when the caterpillars hatch, they eat the milkweed plus the spores. And once those spores get inside the caterpillars, then they break open and then the whole infection cycle sort of goes through its whole, whole thing. And then one spore becomes, becomes 20, becomes 1,000, becomes a million. We counted. One spore can turn into a million spores within a single butterfly. So the number of sp spores on these, these infected monarchs is astronomical. So it really is like glitter falling off these butterflies as they're flying. Infected monarchs often look like this. If you, see, if you look at the top here. These are all monarchs that are heavily infected that simply died when they closed or they couldn't or they were stuck in their pupil case or, or what have you. But a lot of infections look like the ones below. Perfectly normal looking butterflies. This is a huge problem, huge, because you can't tell. I mean, unless you see this, if you see this down here, you can't tell if this butterfly is infected or not. So a lot of these butterflies, if they have a light infection, they'll eclose and turn into an adult butterfly and look completely normal. So there is no way to tell by looking at the butterflies that they're infected or not, unless you do something to, to assess the abdomen for the spores, which I'll get to later. So in your backyard, you probably have monarch butterflies flying around. What you're seeing is this, the lucky few who made it to that stage, who, who are infected, but they're, they look normal. So keep this in mind. These are the lucky few. What you don't see are these going back. These he closed and dropped off the leaves and they just died on the ground or they their, their wings never formed, and so they could never fly, and so you never see them flying around, right? You don't see, and you don't know how many of these are in your backyard right now because they all died. So keep this in mind. You are seeing in Florida the lucky few which are infected. Now, I'm going on and on about this infection because it is a serious problem right now, not just with you in Florida, but with everybody in the U.S., in fact, I was party to a project last last year that came out that was that was published, where my my colleagues and I actually published we we examined butterfly specimens going back to the 1960s to see how much of this infection there was historically, and if you look at the historical average here, a small fraction of butterflies were infected historically, a small fraction, less than one percent. This that's probably the way it's always been. This where this infection was lurking in the background in like one out of 200 monarchs was infected. But now in the last 15 years, it's one in 10 monarchs is infected in the, the majority of the United States. So keep this in mind, not where you are. So I'm going to come back to that. So this is a huge problem. So the other thing that we pointed out in this paper is that this infection reduces monarchs' migration ability. So the high, and we showed this statistically, the higher the infection in the summer, the fewer the monarchs that make it to Mexico. See where I'm getting at here? And all of this has happened since the entire world started trying to save monarchs. So keep this in mind going forward. I should tell you that I know about this infection, you know, because I studied it a little bit myself, but I'm also married to the world expert on this, on this parasite. 
Sonia Altizer is my wife, and she runs this project called Monarch Health. It, it is a citizen science project where she asks volunteers to sample the monarchs that they see in their backyards for this parasite. And she has a instructions on this website. And you, you can go to the website, monarchparasites.org. You can go to this website and you know download the instructions. It's very simple. Um, it involves holding the butterfly in one hand, getting some, some scotch tape and sticking it on their abdomen and then pulling it off. And then you put it on a piece of paper and then you can look at that scotch tape under a microscope to see basically this. This is what you would see. You would see these are abdominal scales and then sandwiched in between the scales would be all of those spores. Um, so I'm telling you this because her project has been going on for now for I think 15 years. And over the years, she has compiled a map showing you the infection prevalence across the breeding range for monarchs. And I'm gonna show you that map now. And I want you to look closely at where you are. So this map is color coded to show you the, the scale of the infection um, according to the site. Whites mean a very little infection and black means heavily, heavily infected. These are all based on those samples that people send to her team to examine. So there's a lot of data now and we can draw some pretty good conclusions now about what the infection prevalence is across the country. And we can see different regions of, that are hotspots. And you, I, know, I know you're all looking at it you, and you can see Florida, right? Florida, and here's a blow up. Florida is a hotspot where infection prevalence is through the roof. And so I don't want you to sort of look at, to find your home and your town here because it doesn't really matter. There's so much hope, there's so much infection in Florida that it doesn't really matter where you live anymore in Florida, that every, all of the monarchs that you see flying around are carrying spores in them. It never used to look like this. Remember the graph I showed you of historical prevalence? Let me go back up here. So if, if, this, if this map were made 30, 40 years ago, all of these dots would be white. That's how things have changed in the last 15 years. 40 years ago, I know, I know I've read actual studies from researchers who have been in Florida, and they don't report huge percentages of infections in, in Florida. In fact, there's, they don't report a whole lot of, of much of anything of significance in Florida. Um, so a lot of this in Florida is, is sort of new, mostly because of our influence, in, uh, our human influence. I mean, we've always known that in, in Miami, in south of Miami, there has been a, um, a non-migratory monarch population that was heavily infected. But it used to be there was only Miami, and now it's the entire state. And I also collaborate with, collaborate with some people in South Georgia, and we also know in South Georgia, the infection prevalence is also through the roof as well. So this zone of infection intensity is spreading outward from you, from you, from Florida. So, and there, but there's also some other, let me go back, back here. There's also some other clear infection zones, South, South uh, California, Southern California is one, Houston, Southern Texas is another, a few other places here and there. Anyway, infection prevalence is high, especially where you are. Where you are, it's, it's, it's over 75%, probably something like 90 to 95%. Basically every butterfly you see flying around in Florida is carrying spores to some degree. So that's the really bad, that's, that's not the really bad, that's just the bad. So, so hang on to your butts. So there's a variety of reasons for why this might be happening in Florida and why it's getting worse. One is because of non-native tropical milkweed, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, this milkweed has a lot of problems. Um, there's a lot of research on this, this milkweed that shows it has problems. Anyone who tells you otherwise is, is misinformed. 
I've done some of the research. I've re I've examined all of the research. It all shows the same thing. This this milkweed harbors the OE parasite more so than other milkweeds. Um, it also enhances or it tends to promote non-migratoriness in monarchs or residency, which also then um, helps to enhance the parasite. People are also raising monarchs in their homes. This is a great way to spread this infection to other butterflies. And if you're doing this, you could be uh, unknowingly contributing to this, this parasite. Even if, if even in Florida, if you go through all of the various steps that you can take to try to keep OE at bay while you're rearing monarchs, like if you go through all the steps to try to release a healthy monarch into Florida, you are still promoting the OE infection. Because think about it, a healthy monarch, especially a female, if you release a healthy female into Florida, it's going to lay its eggs on milkweed that is contaminated with OE. So that healthy monarch is going to have lots and lots of infected babies. So even producing healthy butterflies in Florida is not helping. So that's that's kind of the bad. Okay, take a breath. Now I'm going to get to the really, really bad. I, I kind of already did. The really ugly truth in Florida, especially where you are, is that is this here. Even native milkweed is covered in OE spores in Florida. So swapping out your tropical milkweed, your 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 other non-native milkweed for natives is still not helping. It'll it'll help a little bit, a little bit. But if you think about how, like, if you had a if you had a a, a, a clean milkweed that you grew in a greenhouse and you put it out in your backyard in Florida, how long does it take before a monarch butterfly visits it? A couple of days, right? So, and that butterfly is infected. So cutting back your milkweed, it's replacing with, with natives, all of that, you know, it, it helps in the main North American population you know, where infection prevalence isn't as bad as where it is where, where you. But where you are, it's so bad that every milkweed in Florida is helping to produce infected babies. Everyone. And so this is the ugly truth with Florida that, that and I, I have it here in big, bold letters, so you all know, all of your backyard milkweed is leading to OE infections. Now, to be fair, some of this has always been the case in southern florida southern florida like the extreme south florida but now it's basically the entire state where, where this is happening the other really thing the bad thing that could be happening in florida is that we don't really know how much exchange there is of monarchs to and from florida we do know that monarchs arrive in florida from even as far away as the midwest but we don't know how if they ever come back north in the in the spring. I hope to God that they don't, because they all they would all be contaminated with OE spores. Because when adults infected adults mingle or mate with a with an uninfected adult, that uninfected adult then transport the spores get transferred. So I hope to God that none of the monarchs in Florida ever leave Florida, because Florida is a cesspool of infection. And, it, and I'm afraid there's no other way to say it. Um, that's the really ugly truth with, with, with Florida. Now, what can you do, right? And this is a really hard, hard thing to get across. I So there's a variety of opinions on this, but I only see one option going forward, and you're not going to like it. In fact, you're going to run me out of this meeting with pitchforks because I'm telling you this. Remove your milkweed. I know that sounds crazy, and you, you would rather cut your own arm off than take your backyard milkweed out. But your milkweed is perpetuating the infection cycle. There's no way, there's no way to get around it. You can try to hose it off. You can try to bleach it. You can, you can go to huge steps to fix the situation in your backyard to create healthy monarchs. 
but everybody in Florida has to do it or else it's useless because monarchs can travel 30 kilometers in their lifetime. You're, you're getting monarchs in your backyard from a neighbor that's 220 miles away. So everybody would have to do it. So, so cutting back your milkweed is one thing that people used to say. Um, I think that's just the make yourself feel better option because it really it's not really fixing the problem. It's, it's more like a Band-Aid. So the only thing I see that can help you sleep at night is if you take your milkweed out of the, of the equation. You have lots of butterfly uh, nectar plants, you know, promote butterflies in general. You've got, you've got lots of, of butterflies in Florida and some that are really in trouble, right? The monarch isn't. Remember what I said about the, the, the numbers. Numerically speaking, monarchs in Florida are doing really, really well, but they're, so is the infection. And that's the, the rub, that's the, the hard, there's no way to get around that, unfortunately. Okay, so now that I've destroyed you, let me just sum up here and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I can answer a couple of questions here and you know, hopefully people won't get too mad at me, but really I'm just telling you what the data shows. Numerically speaking, the butterfly, the monarchs are not in trouble despite what you've heard. They're actually increasing. OE infections are, are on the rise, especially in Florida, especially in places where they don't migrate. All milkweed in Florida, everything, whether it's giant milkweed or swan milkweed or whatever you want, it's all covered in OE spores because there is so many infected monarchs flying around dropping their spores. Okay, so if you wanted to know more information about everything I just covered here, feel free to look at my blog. I have a personal blog called monarchscience.org where I, on a monthly basis, I will uh, explain everything I just told you. I'll, what I do is I, I look at recent scientific studies and I sort of explain them in layperson's terms. And every, every month I do a different study and it's a way to sort of for me to convey the science to the, to the lay people. Um, you can also participate in my wife's project if you wanted to know more about the OE infection, because as I said, you folks in Florida really, really need to be experts in this OE infection because there's nothing else that matters in Florida. You can also join my Facebook group, which I just started earlier this year, where I, on a daily basis almost, I'll, I'll, I'll present some scientific facts about monarchs. And I've called it the Thoughtful Monarch because it's, it's a group that I think is, is supposed to make people think about the data, the actual evidence and the science. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna close off and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you again for letting me, me come here and, and destroy you. All right, they, they're, they're clapping in the background. So what we're gonna do is have people walk up. So there might be a delay. Uh, between questions. All right. So let's start with people. Uh, no, no, start with, online. Okay. No, no, so um, if you have a question, you actually have to come up here. Um, let's get the microphones right here. All right. Uh, I'm going to invoke presidential uh, prerogative and have the first two one observation and one question. Uh, this is Dennis Ali. My observation is, and I realize the news media gets things contorted, but isn't the point about the endangerment a bigger picture it's not the monarch that's endangered it's the monarch migration if you think of migration as a separate entity a system like an anthill isn't that what's really endangered and it's not it's not monarch we'll always have monarchs but that 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 uh, life form which is the migration to and from mexico is what's really endangered i don't know if the federal government i'm very familiar with the endangered species act but i don't know if it recognizes a separate critter as a mig migration population as opposed to just a, a species. That's just an observation. You're, uh, you're, you're completely right, yes. Uh, second, and now this is more fundamental. I totally agree with you, but if it's so bad, why do we have all the monarchs? Yes, definitely. Okay, definitely. If, if it's so bad, if it's this destructive and all these monarchs are dying, why are why is the connect the dots for me? Why are we why are we the one state that has all the monarchs? I'll shut up. 
It, no, it's 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 a good question, and I've heard this a lot. The, the short answer is they can reproduce faster than it kills them. So the the monarchs that do emerge, like this one that I'm showing you here, this was taken by my mother. Um, this a, a monarch that emerges infected that, that that still has its wings intact and everything like this, it will live um, at least two weeks, at least, and that's pl plenty long to breed, to, to mate, to, and to lay lots of eggs. They don't live as long as a healthy monarch does, but it's long enough, especially in Florida. So the short answer is in Florida, they can reproduce faster than the, 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 the um, it's killing them. And also, you know, the, the, the reproductive potential of a monarch is just amazing anyway. Like a single female can lay hundreds of eggs. And so, so that's the short answer. A longer answer is that also in Florida, you get an annual influx of healthy monarchs that arrive from as far north as Cape May, also the Midwest. Uh, we're, no one's really sure why this happens every year, but every year it does. And so the population in Florida, the infected population, gets an annual boost every year of fresh bodies. This doesn't happen anywhere else, just Florida. And it's it's kind of a unique thing. It's always been going on. That's not something that's unique. Uh, although I do think and have seen some literature on the point that Florida is a sump. That is, it. It you know they come here to die. And, yeah, it's it's a one way street. Yeah, yeah. I, and I assume your your observation about the length of that these they live, but they're not long lived. That does impact the ability to be migratory. Um, well, they're not migratory in Florida for a couple of reasons. Um, it's not really the infection that keeps them from being migratory. It's it's more more like the weather and the year-round presence of milkweeds. So if you look across the world, where there's monarch populations around the world that have colonized, and were and monarchs have basically created their own little colonies all around the world, wherever they have come across the same conditions you have in Florida, uh, warm climate and year-round milkweeds. Wherever that has happened around the world, they have always sort of set up shop and formed a little non-migratory non population of monarchs. So as long as the conditions are, are right, they'll they'll just be happy, not really happy, they'll they'll live their, eke out their little lives in, in a non-migratory state like you have. All right. This is Barbara McAdam from the University of Florida. <laughs> service go gators just kidding hmm. you guys have the best website on oe i have been on it for over 12 years so i would say that one of the issues is that climate is warmer our monarchs don't need to flee cold fronts coming down we have had not had any hard freezes and with the use of the non-native milkweed we have milkweed all year long, so the female monarchs don't go into diapause. They can keep breeding, laying eggs, and there seems to be plenty of nectar sources. But but you are right. We and then we have heard this from Dr. Jarrett Daniels at the Florida Museum, University of Florida as well, um, of these issues that were sort of like the walking dead population of monarchs yeah. down here. That's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I didn't. I didn't hear a question, but I, I agree with all of what you just said. Oh, uh, well, well, okay. I, I just have one quick question. Um, are scientists studying uh, infections on other butterflies that come to butterfly gardens? So we have OE in the monarchs, but what about giant swallowtails, black swallowtails? Are they also infected um, if they go to a butterfly garden? Good question. Um, this OE is. We, we used to think it was limited to just monarchs and their relatives, but we, we now realize that that's not the case. Um, there has been, there was a recent report of OE found in some random moth species in Europe of all places and one nymphalid. Um, and it was, they found it in butterflies that were being shipped and reared and shipped in a commercial sort of enterprise for those butterfly houses. So we used to think OE was just limited to monarchs and their relatives, but now we're thinking it's probably in some other species as well. 
no one has really done a really thorough job investigating this. My wife has been studying this for many, many years. She's the expert on this thing. She once did a study where, she, I don't know if it's published or not, but she went around to different museum specimens, tried to sample OE from the specimens of different species. She didn't really come up with much, but I don't think anyone's ever done this for, for wild butterflies. I mean, you guys should really do it in Florida because if, if monarch, if anything it has, has an infection, it, it's, it would be in Florida because there's so much OE. Uh, this is Dennis Ali again to rejoin the Florida Georgia battle. Um, we may be the junkies, but isn't the pusher Home Depot and where are they located? So, I mean, it, you can blame this on tropical milkweed for sure. Um, and, you know, I kind of blame the, the whole push to save the monarchs because it, uh, the people in this room, I mean, how many people thought they, need, they needed to get milkweed in their backyard or else the monarchs are going to go extinct, right? And that that drive to save the monarchs is the very thing that is getting people to buy tropical milkweed or any other non-native milkweed there is out there, um, which is just not it's, it's not really true because numerically speaking, the population is not in trouble. The, the migration is, but ironically, the drive to save the monarch is the thing that's actually doing them in because of the rise in OE. And so it's my my take home message to people these days, and it sounds crazy. I tell people just leave monarchs alone. They don't really need our help. And in fact, our help is actually making things worse. It, that's, I know it sounds crazy and it's against everything you've heard from everybody in the world, but that's what I'm, that's what the data sh sh show, tell me. Any other um, questions? Um, do we have any questions from the online audience? Um, here's your time to ask Dr. Davis a question. Just turn yeah. your mic on. Uh, I have a quick question. This is uh, Terry from Palm Beach County. When the female is laying the eggs, that is when the spores that are on her abdomen are being dispersed either on the egg on the egg and on the plant. So would is if they're heavily infected with those spores also contaminate other plants around her or in the mulch? It, would they be contaminating? nectar plants that they're not laying eggs on yes short short answer is yes they every think of it as as like a like a like glitter falling from 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 your hand if you had a handful of glitter in your hand and you and you basically just shook it like this everything beneath your hand would be in would now have spores um i mentioned i mentioned this also like when an uninfected butterfly mates with an infected butterfly, just mates, there is some transfer of spores. And so that formerly uninfected butterfly then goes away carrying spores. That butterfly is not technically infected itself, but it still has enough spores to then drop its uh, when, it, when it does its thing as well. So it really is like glitter and it's on everything. You have to come up. You got to. You got to come up. Is it a question? Is it a is it a question or an observation? We can make that after he's finished. Uh, one more. I have one more question. All right. All right. In the chat, it has with seasonal migration potentially being affected by climate change. Do you think the monarch would intuitively adapt or risk death? That's that's in the chats. Okay, so this is getting at a, a, a an issue or an argument I, I've heard. I've heard this before. If if the monarchs are losing their migrations because of climate change, why not just help the non-migratory populations? And I, I think that's what your question is getting at. Or like, are, are they adapting to to being less migratory? Right. 
I, I think the short answer is here is <clears throat> I don't think we humans need to be helping this along. Yes, it could be happening to some degree, like climate change is actually affecting the migrations of a lot of different species of animals, birds, butterflies, you name it. Um, and it's a pretty well-known phenomenon. So monarchs aren't really any different in that respect. However, some of these some of these problems are coming because of humans. Climate change is a human-driven problem, but you know we don't really need to be helping the monarch to lose its migration. I guess is the short answer. All right. I, yeah, there are a couple of questions on the protozoan, the OA. Uh, how long lived is it, and is there any? I hate to say this, chemical treatment for it. That's it. So um, <clears throat> at least a year, at least a year. And it, it depends on the temperature that it's, uh, that, it, that, is, that it experiences. And there was a recent study on this, but um, yeah, a year is the, is, the, is the short answer. And um, bleach, like a, a, a light bleach solution, that's what we use in the lab to, to disinfect our lab benches. Um, I don't recommend using this on your plants or butterflies or anything else. I mean, bleach isn't in nature, right? So um, I don't really recommend trying to combat this, trying to wash it off in any way because it's, you know, it's it's a losing battle. All right, I think we... I mean, it can exist even without the butterfly? Well, uh, question, can it exist without the butterfly, the protozoan? Mm -hmm. No. It's it's but you know I, I pointed out before that there's there's monarch populations all around the world. Everywhere there's a monarch population, there's also some OE. So o, OE isn't an endangered species in any 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 means at all. Um, so but but the short answer is no. And there's also some some infections in like some some related species too of the monarch, like the soldiers. Uh, the queens, they they also get the, get the get the infection as well, but to a lesser degree. So OE is, is a naturally occurring parasite. It's not going anywhere. It's been with monarchs for for many many years. Um, it and it just sort of seems like we are helping to promote it here. I want to thank you guys while I still have the mic to for allowing me to come here and uh, and sharing the science. And please do. Sign up with to uh, get 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 my blog or or sign up to the Facebook group, and you can hear more of sort of the the real truths the way I, and the way I the way I convey them as well. But thank you again for letting me come here. All right, thank you, Doctor Davis. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll uh, leave the room before the pitchforks forks come out. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. We appreciate your time. Right. Bye bye now. Right. Barbara.
Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think what we heard the scientists yeah. say is that it's every milkweed, including the native yeah. milkweeds. So, but the. They have a taste of the top. Yeah. And so many of them have been raised. I think the bigger issue, which we yeah. can talk about separately, is as we are sponsors for butterfly gardens and we're paying money to create pollinators, it sounds like to me, if you follow the science, there should never be a milkweed no matter where it comes from, it including Everglades yeah. National Park, should not should not be planted. That's what he said. No, I'm, I'm, yeah. any milk way. Just a while, this is still being recorded. You want me to stop recording? Take me down. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hold on, hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 